Um, so uh, today's webinar, we're, this is the Provincial Human Services and Justice Coordinating Committee webinar on older adults in the justice system. Um, a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. We will have some time for Q&A at the end of the presentation. So if you have questions for our speakers, please feel free to type them into the chat box. And we'll have about 10 or 15 minutes at the end of the presentation to get to those questions. Uh, so the webinar will be recorded, um, and the link to that recording will be sent out to all of the participants and made available on our website. We'll also be sending out the presentation slides. Um, and also we'll be doing a brief evaluation survey, so you'll receive that after the webinar, and we'll just ask that you fill that out and let us know what you thought of the webinar so that we can better plan these presentations in the future. Um, and for anyone who's joining us for the first time, the Human Services and Justice Coordinating Committee Network is made up of 39 local committees, 14 regional committees, and one provincial table. <coughs> this is the voluntary collaboration between health and social services organizations, community mental health and addictions organizations, and partners from the justice sector. Um, so with that, I'm going to be passing it over to our presenters for today. Thanks, Sasha. Oh, sorry everyone, just figuring out how to work the slides here. Um, my name is Christine Conrad. I'm a policy analyst at the Canadian Mental Health Association Ontario Division, and I provide policy support to the provincial HSJCC. Uh, I'm joined in the room uh, with Katie Allman, probation and parole officer with the Minister of the Solicitor General, and AJ Grant Nicholson, mental health strategy lead at Legal Aid Ontario. And on the line, we have two other presenters, Sarah Denton, a clinical intake specialist with the Northeast Behavioral Supports Ontario, a house at North Bay Regional Health Center Kirkwood Place, and Phyllis Fair, a board member of both the Alzheimer's Society of Brand, Haldeman, Norfolk, Hamilton, Halton, and of the Dementia Advisory Group. So older adults in the justice system became a priority for the HSJCC network after our members from regional and local committees began observing older adults interacting more with police, being involved in courtrooms, and being detained more frequently in correctional facilities across Ontario. Police, courtrooms, and correctional facilities struggle to meet the needs of this vulnerable population. Dementia, mental health issues, and substance use can further impact older adults' ability successfully navigate the system. Many uh -huh. caregivers do not understand the criminal justice or mental health law system and are not made aware of resources that could improve outcomes for their loved ones. So the provincial HSJCC struck a project advisory committee to look into these issues. And they have created a guidebook to help caregivers and service providers navigate the criminal justice and mental health law system. Uh, and the guidebook also includes resources at every step and highlights some best practices across Ontario. Older Adults in the Justice System, a guidebook for caregivers and service providers, will be released in the coming link, week, sorry, uh, and we will have a link uh, at the end of the slide. Um, we'll also be presenting at the Provincial HSJCC Conference on November 4th. Um, and this is a, a, a long-term project for the network. Uh, our next phase is to develop, develop one-page brochures for older adults, um, and then to continue looking at where uh, we can uh, have a positive impact on this issue going forward. So with that, I'll turn it over uh, to our first speaker, Phyllis Fair. Good afternoon. <clears throat> I would first like to thank you for having me. It is an honor to be here representing as of 2016, an estimated 747,000 Canadians living with dementia, plus about 25,000 um, new cases diagnosed every you. year. By 2031, that number is expected to rise to over 937,000, an increase of 66%. I would like to point out, these are the numbers of people who are diagnosed with Alzheimer's or dementia. This does not account for the number of people who aren't diagnosed. There are a number of reasons that people don't get diagnosed. Fear, stigma, or they think it's a normal sign of aging. 
My so dementia hey. journey began when I was 13 years old. This Monday? Age. My grandmother had I'm a diagnosis free. of Alzheimer's. Years later, my mother was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. When I was 48 years of age, I started to see signs and symptoms. I was working full-time as an ICU RN and okay. on call as a sexual assault nurse examiner. I started to see a few symptoms that I had seen in both my mother and grandma. I'm doing that seminar right now, trying to get I it on the miss, computer. I would misplace things, forget things, and not understand things that I had done for years. At first, I thought maybe I was just overworked, so I gave up my position on the sexual assault team. When this did not help. I saw the family doctor who checked for other causes like menopause, depression, and other diseases that cause these symptoms. Did you find it? Can I have everybody Sorry, please their phone? Yeah. yeah, please everyone make sure that your phone is on mute. We can hear some people talking in the background and it's quite disruptive. So um, just please make sure you're on mute if you have called in. Thank you. Sorry about that, Phyllis. That's okay. All were negative, but I was progressing with my symptoms, forgetting, not being able to understand the written word. I also had difficulty in speaking and understanding language. I went on to see a gerontologist who deals with elderly people who have dementia. I did not fit the mold. After the testing was complete, my husband and I went for the results. My life changed. The doctor walked in and I no longer existed. She spoke only to my husband. She told me that I had early onset Alzheimer's and to return when I could no longer dress myself. I am making an, an assumption that because of my diagnosis, I could no longer speak for myself or make decisions for myself. My personhood was taken away and my capacity was immediately stripped away. It was automatically assumed I could not make my own decisions. I believed this. I fell into the trap that many people believe, which I now know is unfounded. I asked for a second opinion and received a totally different response, which empowered me. It gave me back my life. Although I may have to do things differently, I am still able. I still have my education and my life experiences to draw on. Every person living with dementia have different experiences and all should be treated with dignity and respect. When you tell someone new you have dementia, the majority of times they respond, oh, you forget things. I do not fault these people because that is all they know or are being told about the disease. That is all they see on TV, all they see in the news, and just about anywhere else you can think of. The first thought goes, to a person experience the later part of the progression of the disease. So I'd like to clear this up a little bit now. I call my journey my roller coaster, as it has many ups and downs and many twists and turns. Yes, dementia does cause memory loss. Some have it worse than others. However, dementia also causes losing the ability to multitask, losing the ability to get your words out, getting lost in the moment, which can last for several minutes, anger, frustration, anxiety, nervousness, nervousness, not being able to complete a task that you were able to do without even thinking about before, looking at a familiar face and not knowing the person's name, not being able to get a normal night's sleep, looking at an object you use on a daily basis and not knowing what it's used for. Depression, and I'm talking about serious depression. Also, not to mention the things that change within your body, such as muscle spasms on a daily basis. Having to use a cane because you never know when you're going to lose your balance. And fall, tremors, body sweats. Being unable to be in a room where multiple conversations are going on at the same time. Startling at the drop of a hat. No longer being able to read a book. No longer being able to do simple math. Now, I want to talk about 
things that most people take for granted, like no longer being able to drive a car, losing your independence, losing your self-esteem, not being able to do simple, following, not being able to follow a simple conversation because you misinterpret words that someone is telling you, losing a piece of your identity, a small sliver at a time, having to recognize that as soon as you tell someone you have dementia, that person may automatically assume that you are no longer capable of being able to contribute to society in a meaningful way. That someone assumes that you are no longer capable of learning new things. Or that people will start treating you differently. Some will talk about you as if you're no longer in the room. Oh, and here's a good one. Being able to have a decent conversation with someone, only to have them say, well, you don't look like you have dementia. Can you tell me what someone that has Alzheimer's or dementia looks like? Or that some people will disappear from your life after learning your diagnosis. This can happen to all any person living with Alzheimer's or dementia. It can happen. All of these can happen or a few of these can happen. You can experience these all in one day or not at all. Dementia is not just forgetting forgetfulness, or memory loss. No one, and I mean no one, knows how long the progression of the disease will take from one person to another. I firmly believe that we are all still here, we are all still able to contribute, and we are all still able to learn new things. That we still have a voice and believe that no decision is made for us, nothing about us without us. We may do things differently and rely on close family to assist us because they know and understand us the best. But we, we are able to participate until the disease progresses to the end stage. There are little things you can do to communicate with a person living with Alzheimer's to help them in their communication. These are simple little things like if you ask a question, allow them enough time to understand the question and to reply. There is nothing more frustrating than when somebody asks me a question and I'm trying to formulate my answer and they move on to something else. Some of the other things that may assist is being in an area that is quiet so there is not other things distracting our thoughts or pulling our minds towards something else so that we can focus directly on the person we're speaking with. There is a good website through the Alzheimer's UK that gives you a whole list of things you can do to help in communicating with somebody living with dementia. What I have to point out is that don't take it for granted that the person doesn't know. Speak slowly, clearly, and a lot enough time for the conversation to happen. If the person wants a family member present, you may focus your communication with the person who has dementia and allow them to refer to the family member when needed. Important to remember that these people are able to make decisions about themselves and their care until the time comes in the later stages that they just need more assistance. I would like to leave you with one final thought about people living with dementia, and that is that we have rights that need to be honored. I could go into a, into the different human rights that we have, but with this talk being about justice, I'm going to talk about Article 12 of the Human Rights under the Charter of Rights of People with Disabilities, which covers equal recognition before the law. Canada with Canadians with intellectual, cognitive, psychosocial, and communication disabilities face pervasive discrimination in the exercise of their legal capacity, largely on the basis that a person appears unable to meet this discriminatory cognitive testing of capacity. As a consequence, many are systematically denied the right to make personal life, health care, and financial decisions. And 
to be free of forced restraint and seclusion in psychiatric health facilities. Guardianship, substitute decision-making, and involuntary admission committal systems still firmly placed with some provinces actively resisting reform. Despite the scale of the legal mandate interference in the autonomy of the person with a disability in Canada, there is no coordinated plan to consider alternatives, repeal offending statuses, or replace them with legal recognition of system support. These provisions remain the primary mechanism to address the legal status of people who require support to exercise legal capacity and thus perpetuate systematic discrimination and inequality in the Canadian law and society. Moreover, some province, provincial governments are actively resisting reform consistent with Article 12. For example, despite detailed proposals to the introduction to introduce supportive decision making into Nova Scotia law, draft Adult Capacity and Decision Making Act, an outcry from disability organizations, the provincial government and legislation rejected the proposal and passed a new guardianship law. Thank you, Phyllis. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Am I sorry? The duty to accommodate in decision making is not well articulated in domestic law. <coughs> Leaving health, justice, and financial sectors without accountability for continued discrimination. People with communicate related disabilities are highly vulnerable to lacking needed support to exercise legal capacity. They are lacking qualified arm's length professionals to assist in accurately and authentically guiding decision making. To date, there has been little or no attention to these issues. There is no legal or policy framework in place to ensure to support that may be required to exercise the capacity. I'd like to thank you for listening today, and let's all try to put ourselves in the place of a person living with Alzheimer's and dementia or any cognitive impairment and understand what they want and need. Thank you. Thank you, Phyllis, and now moving. Oh, go ahead, Sarah. No problem. I was just going to say thank you again, Phyllis, for starting us off with this very important discussion. And thank you to Tasha and Christine for convening us all here today. Um, my name is Sarah Denson, and as mentioned, I'm a clinical lead with the Northeast Behavioral Supports Ontario. For those of you on the line who might be a little bit less familiar with BSO, we look slightly different depending on the region of the province in which you reside. However, our mandate's the same. We're looking to enhance that system coordination to better support older adults with or at risk of responsive behaviors that might be associated with either dementia, mental health, substance use, and or neurological conditions. As well, we also support adults who might have an age-related illness, such as an earlier onset of dementia. As a result of this, we don't have a specific age criteria for a program. Our services aim to support not only the individual experiencing the responsive behaviors, but also their family and any formal service providers that might also be involved. Um, and that does include those within the justice sector as well. So what is a responsive behavior? Um, we believe it's a form of communication of an unmet need or a response, often unintentional, to something important in a person's environment. Um, it can be a result of changes in the brain that have impacted not only the person's memory, but also their judgment, orientation, and at times also their mood. Um, it can range from physical actions, such as hitting out, 
kicking or verbal expressions such as yelling or cursing that can also include forms of restlessness, walking without purpose, eating or drinking an inappropriate item, hiding or collecting things, or sometimes more of those disinhibited behaviors um, that could include things such as disrobing in public or making a verbal or physical sexual advance. It's important to know that while responsive behaviors can occur with dementia, which is sort of more of an umbrella term, um, not everybody with these conditions will experience responsive behaviors. In BSO, we believe that all behavior has meaning, and part of our role is often trying to determine what might be triggering the behavior and how best to meet and anticipate the needs um, of that person to minimize future behaviors. Um, personhood is really the foundation and key assessments of BSO, um, where we really strive to learn the person's life story. What matters most to them, both at present, but also in the past, um, any preferences that they might have, preferred routines, sources of comfort, but also their dislikes, past traumas, and things that might be a trigger to help inform our recommendations and best understand what may be driving the behavior we're seeing. Information gathered uh, through the personhood can also be of significant value in supporting police and first responders, especially in the events um, where someone with dementia might become lost or go missing. Here, a large part of our work is having those conversations with family around how to mitigate these risks, as well as exploring possible resources that are currently available, such as the vulnerable persons registries, GPS tracking devices, or wearing a medical alert cell bracelet that has that relevant information, um, as well as environmental considerations such as setting an alarm. So in case, you know, during the night someone does a get up and sort of goes for the door, that someone else within the home can be alerted uh, to ensure their safety. In addition, we also focus on a lot of um, those pieces around what information is crucial to share in the event that you do need to reach out to police so that they can best respond and interact with the older adult. So while recognizing that older adults will interface with the legal system for a variety of reasons, um, today we really hope to share a few of our examples and experiences through BSO and different emerging practices that might be of interest to you all. Um, over the years, we've had multiple shared cases with the justice sector, um, including even one of our first referrals to BSO here in the Northeast uh, that had come up from a court support worker uh, who, when meeting with the older adult, you know, was able to quickly recognize that there was something that was not quite right and questioned if this individual may have been experiencing a form of dementia. Through our involvement um, with that court support worker and the individual themselves, we were able to tease out that, in fact, the person was instead in a delirium, um, which is more of that acute medical state that is treatable. But at that time, because of the delirium, the person was unable to recognize who their spouse was. And instead, they were perceiving their spouse to be a stranger invading their home, which, as you can imagine, resulted in significant distress and fear for that older adult um, who reacted as though their safety was in jeopardy and resulted in the criminal offense. Through experiences such as this, we've come to realize just how important it is to form linkages between our program and those within the justice sector, which has driven many of our initiatives outlined in sort of the third column of the slide that focuses on BSO's third pillar of building a capacity and creating knowledgeable care teams. In the Northeast, this has involved various education sessions with first responders such as community paramedics, police, mental health court support workers, um, really focusing on those dementia basics, uh, targeting how to recognize a neurocognitive disorder versus a mental health concern, or teasing out what might be a medical emergency such as delirium, and then from there, exploring alternative pathways, including possible diversion, um, to ensure that the person's needs are best being addressed. Um, in partnership with our local Alzheimer's Society chapters, many of these sessions have also focused on how to deliver communication and how best to respond to someone who might be experiencing responsive behaviors to avoid that behavioral escalation. 
a few years ago, we were also successful in obtaining pilot grants with paramedics uh, locally in Sudbury to deliver a more comprehensive education program focusing on those three Ds of dementia, delirium, and depression, and more in-depth clinical coaching on quick assessment tools that they could then use in the field, such as the CAM EMS, uh, which is one of our delirium screening tools that's the best practice, but then catered a little bit more to the unique needs of paramedics. Provincially, we're also hearing from many, sorry, many of our BSO psychogeriatric resource consultants or public education coordinators whose roles are focused on delivering such education and other capacity building activities to providers across the sector that they too are increasingly identifying police and EMS as key groups that they're working with and supporting, which is quite exciting. In the Northeast, um, following each of these education sessions, we've also created a direct or you know, a priority referral pathway, which is outlined in uh, the second column of this slide. This came out of recognition that police, EMS, support, support workers, as well as mobile crisis teams don't have the time to fill out lengthy referral forms or always have the information needed uh, to do so. What they do need is that ability to reach out in the moment and speak with a skilled clinician, be able to share their observations and seek that guidance as to how and what services would be most appropriate to urgently connect that older adult to. Um, since our program began, we've had a centralized intake model uh, here in the Northeast with a 1-800 number, which has really helped us facilitate this direct referral pathway quite nicely. And over the past two years, uh, with the support um, through the ministry for the dementia strategy, we're also seeing many more BSO teams across the province exploring similar coordinated access or central intake models to ease that system navigation which is promising similar opportunities for more of these direct and priority referral pathways um, across all of Ontario. Another emerging uh, trend that we're seeing is this concept of having specialized geriatric teams within the police sector, including such roles as senior liaison officers, can respond to calls where having that enhanced knowledge and skill in supporting older adults can be vital. Across the province, we're also seeing more and more situation tables outlined in the first column, um, or older adult liaison tables, as they're sometimes referred to, emerging, which is another exciting uh, avenue, as this is an area where we've seen success through the BSO membership as well. These tables often provide that ability um, to connect to older adults who may be routine, sorry, routinely interfacing with police because of their responsive behaviors on the flip side, are not presenting to more conventional health-related services to access that care or obtain, obtaining that diagnostic clarification or treatment. Um, these tend to be those cases where someone might be prone to either losing or misplacing an item or withdrawing money from the bank, but then can't remember having done so. And as a result, are instead coming to the conclusion that someone must have stolen the missing item, which then results in those repeated calls to police with allegations of theft, or they might have that feeling of being persecuted and then become often frustrated by the perception that their concerns are not taken seriously, which inadvertently then may lead to escalations or more altercations with the public as a result of their misperception and at times leading to more criminal consequences. And lastly, many of our most complex uh, cases are those involving older adults with prior interactions with the justice sector. Um, these are individuals who might have prior criminal convictions and are now experiencing a dementia and require higher levels of personal care, but unable to access it because of their history with the justice sector. Uh, in cases like these, we find that those multi-agency care conferences are often quite helpful. Um, this can include engaging various community partners, but also consulting with specialists, including those within our own sector of geriatric medicine and geriatric psychiatry, but then reaching out uh, to that justice sector and engaging that expertise either through forensic psychiatry um, or other members to really kind of seek your own expertise and guidance. Um, the assessment of actual and ongoing risk is often the most challenging area um, that we experience where we really need you know, everybody to kind of come together and be part of that assessment to best inform interventions moving forward and that person with the most appropriate
appropriate care environment. At times, this might also involve accessing supports from acute care or tertiary care for those more comprehensive inpatient assessments and care planning over the course of several months. Um, for the sake of time, I think I'll leave it there as there's so many more discussions that we no doubt could entertain. However, I would happily uh, turn it over to AJ at this time to speak further on the justice and mental health system. Uh, hi, everybody. I uh, hope everybody's doing well on this National Seniors Day. Uh, thank you very much for that segue. Uh, I'm going to be covering uh, briefly, or as brief as possible, the criminal justice system as well as the civil mental health system. Uh, and I'll also briefly touch on the forensic system. So in the criminal justice context, the person will become engaged in that system once they have been arrested. For older persons or persons with age-related illness, this could be due to the fact that they were charged for striking out at a person like a PSW in a care facility or a domestic uh, assault uh, of a family member or spouse. These could arise while they were performing activities of, uh, of daily living or ADL, like bathing the, the individual or dressing the person. Uh, once the person is arrested, uh, they may either be held in custody pending a bail hearing, or they could be given a promise to appear with a court date. I think that's probably the best case scenario. Once they are arrested, and if they are held in custody, um, the person uh, is always uh, free to speak uh, to duty counsel uh, via the Bridges hotline. But of course, that can be problematic if the person's unwell. Um, at this point, it is important uh, to remember that uh, it is important for loved ones uh, or support persons to follow up with the police if they can to find out where the accused person is going to be brought for the bail hearing. Bail hearings typically happen the next morning um, where possible. Um, so uh, if they are arrested on the weekend, this can be a bit tricky too because uh, they'll be brought to wash court or weekend in statutory holiday court, um, which not, may not be in the same jurisdiction or area where the person was arrested. So, for example, I'm, I did a lot of work in Hamilton. Hamilton is where the wash court is for that area, but if a person's picked up in Milton, they'll go to Hamilton on the weekend for the bail hearing, but ultimately their matter will be dealt with in Milton court. So it's important to keep in mind that they might not be in the area where they're picked up for the weekend. Um, it's important for people that want to sit with a release uh, on bail uh, to get to court early uh, for the bail hearing so that they can work with duty counsel or their lawyer to come up with the release plan. Um, persons who are going to be coming to court to assist uh, might become surety. Uh, a surety is essentially a person who's going to take the role of being eyes and ears of a court in the community uh, and ensure that the person goes to their court dates um, and they're going to be responsible for them while they're uh, dealing with their criminal matter. Um, sometimes uh, the court might uh, allow the person to be released on their own recognizance and they won't need a surety. But regardless, a support person or a loved one would want to come to court and work with uh, uh, their, the lawyer, whether it's their own lawyer or duty counsel, to come up with a release plan. If a person doesn't have a loved one or a surety in the court or the Crown would like to have the person have a surety, there's also bail supervision, supervision programs uh, through uh, organizations like the John Howard Society. A bail hearing can be contested or uncontested, um, ideally from a criminal uh, lawyer uh, standpoint. It's it's always better for it to be uncontested. Um, and there's very varying levels of restriction for uh, the release. Um, it's also important to keep in mind that you only get one ticket to camp. So it's very important that you have your plan in place, a good release plan to present to the court, to present to the Crown so maybe you can get a, an, uh, an uncontested bail hearing. The court will go along with it and you can get the person uh, released as soon as possible. But again, it's, it's all premised on the idea that you get to court quickly and you get to speak with the counsel and you have your plan ready. Um, this can be tricky in my experience because quite often when people are arrested, they don't expect to be arrested. Um, and even in the best of circumstances, even if a person's well, they don't always have their phone numbers on them. So maybe a good strategy would be keeping phone numbers that are important of loved ones and support persons on, on your person. Um, once the matter of bail is settled, uh, the accused person uh, will be given, uh, once the bail is settled or if the person is given a promise, they'll have another court date. Uh, in what we call that date court or uh, appearance court. And in this court, you can, uh, uh, you'll probably receive your disclosure in case that's said against you uh, from the Crown Prosecutor. And again, it's advisable to come early to the counsel before court begins about your case and to review your options. Um, there are mental health court workers in criminal court organizations like CMHA and Fred Victor, who can 
with uh, bail plans or connecting accused persons to social and health support. Uh, and again, it's a good idea to gauge the person's persistence for an accused person who doesn't have a home to go to uh, as a result of their arrest. In terms of resolution, there is mental health version potentially available for uh, accused persons who might have an age-related illness. Um, and there's also mental health support. Mental health support is a therapeutic, a therapeutic support uh, where mental health support centralized support itself is geared to supporting persons with mental health needs. Mental health. To keep in mind about mental health diversion is that it's a crown-based policy, and they are the gate gatekeepers. Uh, as well, the accused person has to consent to getting the diversion as well, too. Uh, there are particular offenses that automatically make the accused person ineligible for the program, and there are a list of factors that the Crown has to go through uh, in consideration of whether or not diversion is appropriate. And again, you know, everybody's free to see these uh, policies. They're available on the Ministry of Attorney General's website. Uh, mental health court um, is a form of therapeutic court, um, but there is no overarching mandate or rules for what constitutes a mental health court in Ontario. Uh, that's challenging because not all jurisdictions even have a mental health court. Uh, but they will have some common characteristics, like they will sit in the same courtroom for continuity uh, and have more of a relaxed decorum. Uh, and many take a graduation approach to dealing with the matter, so there's a lot of adjournment where the accused works towards addressing their underlying mental health needs, uh, and uh, they're giving uh, the court regular updates in terms of their progress. Uh, and when the sentencing happens, the sentencing is mindful of the mental health needs of the accused, and uh, there were concrete steps taken towards addressing, again, those um, underlying factors that may have led to a uh, criminal offense. If the accused does not wish to plea um, or doesn't want to ga engage in mental health diversion or mental health court, and they'd like to contest the charges because they have a defense, uh, they can set down the matter for trial. Uh, and uh, that can be funded for, uh, through legal aid, but again, it's important to remember that they have to be financially eligible. If a person so unwell that they can't uh, go to trial, they, might be, they may be found to be unfit to stand trial following a fitness assessment. Uh, this is what we call a Form 48 assessment. This will be followed by a fitness hearing where the court can appoint counsel to the accused. Also, the court might find a person not criminally responsible due to a mental disorder as outlined by the criminal code. The distinction here is that fitness relates to the mental state of the person while they're going through the court proceedings, and uh, uh, not criminally responsible finding uh, relates to uh, the time of the event and uh, criminal intent and lack of intent due to uh, uh, mental disorder. Um, if you're found either unfit or um, NCR for short, um, you will fall under the jurisdiction of the Ontario Review Board. And this is now the forensic stream. And this is, is, is potentially uh, really bad for an accused person, uh, for an accused person, uh, because uh, they can be under this uh, board's jurisdiction indefinitely. And that means being in a forensic psychiatric unit indefinitely, potentially. Um, Whereas if they pled guilty, perhaps there would be no custodial sentence. Uh, the review board does hold regular um, reviews, usually on an annual basis, to look at uh, uh, the disposition or how the person is going to be housed uh, on that forensic unit and whether or not they, get, they can get discharged or get day passes. But again, it can go on for a very long time. Uh, the court can also make treatment orders if a person is found unfit to keep them fit while their criminal matter is being dealt with in, in court. And again, when sentencing uh, happens, there's a range of sentences that a court can, can uh, use to, to sanction a person. And it can be, again, a custodial sentence for a person who has to go to prison. It can be a non-custodial sentence. Uh, and again, the criminal code outlines the possible sentences for each offense. And when sentencing occurs, you know, ideally you'll have the assistance of a lawyer. You can have, have the assistance of duty counsel. And they will uh, help the court uh, weigh both mitigating uh, factors, and the court will consider the aggravating uh, factors, and again, um, you know, they'll consider what the best sanction is. It's important to remember, too, that um, in the criminal context, the court, other than, uh, you know, uh, making a treatment order, can't in sentencing force somebody to take treatment, but in my experience, it's quite often uh, when there are cases involving persons with uh, age-related illnesses or other mental health illnesses, they might uh, want the person to consent to some form of treatment-related term in their sentence. Um, some of the challenges I've seen in, in the criminal justice context, I mean, first of all, when we talk about mental health court, it's typically geared towards persons with 
psychiatric illnesses like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, it's not necessarily always geared towards a person with geriatric needs, so that's a challenge. Um, some of the housing support that you'll get, again, won't be for a very vulnerable person that has uh, age-related uh, needs or might have an age-related illness, and that might cause the person to uh, languish while the court and support persons and duty council and lawyers try to figure out the best plan for this person to get released on bail or how to deal with uh, their, their substantive charges. Um, the other challenge that we see in, in court is how do we get this person back to court? So, you know, the court's okay with having them being released, released on their own cognizance, but if the person doesn't have supports or a loved one uh, that can bring them back to court, that can potentially set them up for additional fail to appear charges. So, uh, you know, it is, there's a lot of challenges and I think it's vitally important that we all kind of work together to address these challenges and, uh, you know, um, the, the justice system has to be apprised of the supports in the community and that's why efforts like this uh, is very important in terms of disseminating information about supports and uh, making people aware of the different needs uh, this population has. Now I'm just going to quickly go over the civil mental health system because I know my, my time is very short. But uh, the civil mental health system uh, contrast to the criminal justice system is usually when a person has either been uh, involuntarily admitted into a psychiatric facility, um, either uh, on a form uh, for um, psychiatric examination, which is then followed by uh, an involuntary admission uh, certificate, or they can interface with the system if they're in the healthcare system and they're found to be uh, um, mentally incapable to consent to treatment. Um, in either case, uh, Legal Aid Ontario does fund uh, representation for persons that want to contest these, uh, these findings in front of the Consent Capacity Board. Um, but what I'd like to clarify for everybody is that unfortunately Legal Aid doesn't have the ability or the means to also fund representation for loved ones. So the capable person should be able to get representation. Uh, unfortunately, uh, loved ones, family members won't be able to get that kind of support. Um, there's also community treatment orders that um, doctors might use as uh, maybe as a, a kind of a compromise in between having a person uh, stuck on a unit indefinitely while they're determining whether or not to be well enough to be in the community, and uh, it's the way it's just. Uh, the doctor is being able to ensure that there's treatment being taken on a regular basis and there's regular supervision. Um, however, you know, uh, these, these, these treatment orders, in my opinion, sometimes can be a bit overreaching, uh, and it's important, I think, at least to um, uh, consider the appropriateness of some of the terms. And again, Legal Aid Ontario can fund representation for a person if they want to contest it in front of the CCP. Uh, and lastly, just quickly, I'll just touch on substitute decision making and um, the laws around that in Ontario. So substitute decision making is, is governed by the Substitute Decisions Act. And when we talk about the subject, substitute decision making, uh, we are largely talking about power of attorneys and guardianship appointments. Just really quickly, I want to just point out that guardianship um, appointments and, and power of attorneys both can be potentially abused. Um, when it comes to power of attorneys, it, it can easily be abused because they're very easy to enter into. You just need two witnesses. Uh, it's, you don't really need a court um, to, to um, make them happen. Uh, and, um, you know, once uh, a person's under a power of attorney, it can be very difficult to revoke it. Uh, so keep that in mind. Um, always try to seek counsel from a lawyer where possible, even though it's not necessary to enter into a power of attorney. Uh, there's power of attorney for property and there's power of attorney for personal care. And uh, in order to revoke one, you essentially just need the same amount of uh, capacity to enter into one. But again, it can be very difficult if uh, there's a power dynamic in play that's uh, unbalanced. Um, and then guardianship appointments or guardianships uh, contrasted to uh, power of attorney come into play when a person's already incapable, they can't enter into uh, an instrument like power of attorney. And essentially, it's, it's, it's either a court appointment or it happens through the PGT, uh, and they get involved and they can help make decisions for a person. But again, um, there are uh, ways to um, uh, ensure that these are, are done lawfully and in the best interest of the person. Um, and the person can always bring an application to terminate a guardianship that they're under. Uh, they can also bring applications to vary the, the guardianship. And Legal Aid does fund representation uh, for persons that might be under a guardianship, but only pursuant to a Section 3 direction where the PGT is directed to apply for uh, Legal Aid by the court. Uh, and again, I'd like to um, point out that there's other supports other than legal aid uh, for persons uh, that might need some assistance in this context. There's also advocacy support 
through uh, uh, the advocacy center for the elderly aid legal clinic, and and that's it for me. Hi, it's uh, Katie Alma, I'm a probation and parole officer. Uh, so on the heels of what AJ was talking about in terms of the justice system, I just want to say that I'm speaking as a probation and parole officer and not on behalf of my employer, the Ministry of the Solicitor General. Um, I just want to obviously um, reiterate that the correctional system, which includes the uh, the justice system, which includes the correctional system both federally and provincially, are are not we're not developed to to cope with the, our aging client population, um, and thus we are faced with um, many capacity issues. Now, I just want to just um, back up a minute and just say that overall, and this is not scientific, this is based on my experience and that of my colleagues, and uh, there is some research that's being started in this area, that it generally what we find is our client response, uh, aging clients who are in the justice system, their general response is one of confusion. We're seeing a lot of people, uh, although we see many people who have already been in the justice system and are aging in the system, I work with a large homeless population in downtown East Toronto, Moss Park, so uh, many of my clients have been in the system for a long time. Um, even those who have been in them for a long time, as they develop cognitive issues, cognitive impairment, and uh, different forms of dementia, they may not recall having been in the system, so they're very confused by it. We also have clients who have never been in the system and find themselves charged with, for example, a domestic violence offense and are in the position where uh, the caregiver is the victim or the alleged victim and the individual can no longer live in the home pursuant to court order and we have, uh, we're dealing with family members who are distraught that the father or husband or partner who they've been caring for for many years can no longer live there and is basically on the street and has requirements to follow a court order. So there's a whole education piece in trying to, uh, in dealing with the family as well. It, it, it creates a, a tremendous amount of distress for everyone. Uh, the custody settings for our clients, um, obviously a client going into custody with uh, dementia or um, cognitive impairment related to other dementias uh, it presents a number of challenges. The physical environment, uh, as you're probably not surprised to hear, were not originally intended for aging clients. Uh, medical treatment varies across the various uh, institutions across the province and facilities and staff capacity will vary across those institutions. I would like to say that this is changing. The, the delivery of medical resources and treatment in our facilities is is greatly improving, and there is a, uh, an acknowledgement of the need to adapt to the fact that we have an aging client population. And it's not just, obviously, uh, cognitive impairment or cognitive um, limitations or there's the activities of daily living that AJ was talking about. There are, there's a physical impact, you know, the sort of physical layout of institution can be a challenge as well for the complex needs of our clients. The best practices, um, supports, and services for clients. I mean, we have, we heard from DSO. That's a great resource, obviously, uh, Behavioral Supports Ontario. Really important to connect with an agency that works specifically with clients uh, who are aging. One of the challenges is sometimes agencies don't have experience dealing with the justice system. So there's sort of this, oh my gosh, what are we getting ourselves into? Um, or, or sort of an intuitive pushback. We're very fortunate in Toronto. Obviously, we're very well resourced. So I work with some agencies that are uh, conversant in the, the vagaries of the justice system, so they're, they're willing to work with our clients. Uh, and I try to get a case manager for my client because I, of course, a client won't report if they don't remember they're on <laughs> probation or a conditional sentence, and when they do come to see me, they don't know why they're there, so the case manager helps facilitate that process. Um, with regard to release from custody, we were talking earlier, actually AJ talked about this, is the dearth of housing. This isn't just a Toronto problem, it's a problem across the province. Long-term care lists are quite long, um, and the challenge is if, you have a client, if we have a client with a history of violence or acting out, many long-term care facilities are disinclined to take that individual, and sometimes they end up, as you said, in the forensic system, which is for a much longer period of time than they normally would have been supervised, and that is not a place for our clients to be. So there's a challenge in, in getting clients placed because of their criminal justice history. Yeah, caregivers are apprehensive about dealing with the individual. They may have acted out. Um, you know, they're scared, they're confused, and they also now have a criminal record. So this is sort of the, the stigma and discrimination that's associated with being in the justice system compounds their already vulnerable uh, the cognitive and, and physical state. When I'm dealing with clients who have a, a, a 
dementia, my, it, my main focus is to be as sensitive as possible, try to explain things as simply as possible. For anyone who's ever talked to me, you're familiar with the fact that I talk really fast, and I tend to double up on my sentences, so I really have to slow down and be very clear with my instruction. Uh, I try to ensure that the client is with an advocate, or as I said, a case manager, to have a third party there, help that individual. I provide written instructions. I, um, I really, it's much more of a social work approach than a criminal justice approach, simply because the client often has no idea why they are in my office and why they are bound by these conditions. And my goal is to ensure that they don't have conflict with the law again, because for them, uh, they don't know that they're not supposed to go to a certain place. They don't recall that. They don't know that maybe they're not supposed to, or they don't recall that they're not supposed to contact the wife who they, to whom they've been married for 50 years. So the, um, it's a much more complex client management, and it really requires the expertise of people who are in that field. More, have, they have far more expertise than I. And that's, those are my comments. Thanks, Katie. All right, uh, we have some time for questions. So if you'd like to ask a question, uh, please type it in the chat box, uh, and we'll begin to monitor, monitor that. Well, uh, I might just ask a question here. So uh, to our speakers, um, you've been involved in the writing of this guidebook. Um, what do you see as a possible next step for this uh, project? It's a road show. OK. <laughs> I think it's very important to get the word out to as many different uh, persons in not just the justice sector, but in the health sector and social uh, agencies, I think. The more people know about this, the better, uh, and the better we can all work together, especially in an environment where perhaps um, resources are not as plentiful. I think it's very important that we all are more familiar with each other's agency services and work together better to uh, support these persons. Thanks, AJ. I think there's real need to do research in this area. I mean, there's been a lot of talk about it. There's some initial research being done, but I think both federally and provincially, we should look at um, look at the trends. We, I mean, we have data on how old our clients are, the question is, what are the diagnoses? I, I, I might just point out, too, a lot of the time our clients have either been disinclined to or have not had the capacity or the ability to attend for assessments. They, have, they often have not seen a family doctor or any kind of specialist for years, so we often suspect there's an issue, but, but we, don't have, we don't have a formal diagnosis. So a real need to uh, enhance resources and ensure that clients are properly assessed and then assisted. Uh, and then um, and some research on that as well. Thanks, Katie. Any other questions? Or anyone on the line? Uh, Sarah or Phyllis, do you want to chime in on that? Uh, what our next steps could be? I would definitely echo, sorry, it's Sarah, um, the comments that were already made. Um, just around really that need for enhancing awareness of all the different services that are available to support older adults, but also through the justice sector as well, and just really having those opportunities to have that knowledge translation between our different sectors, you know, be it more health-related services or community services and those within uh, the justice um, side, just to better understand how each system works, how we can partner together, because um, as mentioned, these are not straightforward, easy cases. You know, a lot of the clients that we work with have, you know, multiple medical comorbidities, but other, you know, complex um, concerns and challenges that they're facing on a daily basis, and we really need that full partnership to be able to work together to really best address their needs and support their families and those informal support networks that they do have around them as well. Thanks, Sarah. And I just want to reiterate, the more we educate the public, the better off everybody is going to be. Thanks, Phyllis. Very true. So we, we have some resources here for you. Uh, first of all, the link to our guidebook, which will be posted in the coming weeks. Um, next, some information about Behavioral Supports Ontario. And finally, uh, a link to Legal Aid Ontario and their support. So, um, and also in the chat box, uh, there's a link here to Elder Abuse Ontario, um, and they have prepared a safety planning toolkit 
for service providers. Um, yeah, and, and just the yeah, more comments here that people are, are seeing this. Um, yeah. So uh, this is obviously a huge issue. Um, you can hear more about it uh, at the Provincial HSJCC conference. I encourage everyone to register if you haven't already. Um, and please fill out the evaluation form. Um, if you want to hear more about different aspects at that conference, we're happy to, to tailor this presentation um, and change it up a little bit. Um, or, or any ideas for our future work, we, we really would like to hear from you. Um, I want to thank all of our speakers for coming today. We really appreciate sharing all of your knowledge and expertise with us. Um, and thanks to all the participants for tuning in as well. Okay, thank you. We're going to sign off for now. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.